Oh, oh, I forgot. There's a counter. Okay, no counter in this. <laughs> Here's a counter. <laughs> Okay, I'm Rusty. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining this live stream, uh, whether you're watching right now or you're watching the recording. Um, yeah, usually during these live streams, you have a countdown, and I just completely forgot to put the countdown on, and I just hit go live because I thought in my mind the countdown goes automatically on, but it doesn't. So we figured that one out. <laughs> um, yeah, so really excited for today's live stream because I have been working for the past month on a dagger tutorial and we're going to talk in this live stream about why i chose to focus the time that i have for my youtube channel on dagger and what dagger is actually and we have a very amazing guest here kyle from dagger <laughs> hello, hello welcome thank you so much for joining my live stream yeah, yeah. thanks for having me <laughs> do you want to give people kind of an overview of who you are uh name job title well, company of Dagger, of course. Um, what's your favorite tool that you use on a day-to-day? -day? Could be programmatic tool, could be any tool, any platform you're using. And fun fact, go. Perfect, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I'm Kyle, um, I'm with Dagger. I'm a solutions engineer there. Um, I have a background in um, DevOps and release engineering and those kinds of things. So in my past, I was always, um, you know, one of those titles. Um, and what else do we have? Um, favorite tool that I use? Um, favorite tool. I feel like that changes way too often. Um, I like to, you know, kind of nerd out about different tools and get really invested into yeah. the tool and then find my new favorite one. Um, historically, like Redis was always something I've been fascinated with since I first discovered it um, like a decade ago at this point. Um, yeah. I've been trying and i actually will see it uh today but like i've been trying to live more in uh nix os so that's kind of the the latest one for me um and i guess in the, in the demo we'll see uh how well that's working out awesome excited for the demo what's a fun fact about you fun fact um let's see i live in michigan right now and we had a nice little snowstorm this morning oh. uh, so right before this i got out and uh plowed the road and uh, got the snow removed just in time to come do this demo. Amazing. You made it. You made it just yes. in time. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are really glad that you made it to have you here this way around. So um, awesome. We have Nick joining. Hi, Nick. Thank you so much for joining. Is Nick from Dagger? No. Is he? No? Maybe? No, but happy to... <laughs> see some new faces in the stream just sometimes people from the company are joining and i don't know i hope you can still mm -hmm. hear me can you see me yep My oh yeah i think the video might have frozen. Yeah, i froze uh -oh. oh no okay let's let's turn it off and on again little hiccups does it still work oh no let's see okay other camera okay i'm back okay. cool Sorry. Okay. Amazing. So let's get started with Dagger. What is Dagger? What's your elevator right. pitch? <laughs> yeah. Should I go ahead and share my screen? Go for it. All right. Okay. Use your screen. Awesome. Perfect. Oh. All right. So Dagger, uh, the headline here that we can see on the site, uh, CICD is code that runs anywhere. Um, and so let's dig into what each of those uh, parts of that mean. So I have a yeah. cool little slide deck here. Uh, so Dagger is CICD as code that runs anywhere. And so when we say as code, what we're referring to is actual like programming languages that you uh, they use on your day-to-day -day as a developer, right? So that's like Go, TypeScript, Python, and so on. Like there's so many SDKs that you can use uh, to write Dagger code. But yeah. the main thing is you're actually writing code and you're not writing uh, configuration. You're not writing, you're not writing like YAML, uh, but you're also not writing like bash, right? So you're writing actual mm -hmm. code that can be tested. Uh, in some cases can, can be compiled, like all these things that you expect with uh, an actual programming language. Yeah. And so you have all these um, languages that sit in between the Dagger engine, which we'll dig into in a minute of like what that part means. And then all these modules that you can use to compose pipelines. 
Um, and so the second part of that was as code that runs anywhere, right? So by anywhere, we mean like your, uh, your development machine, uh, your CI, so GitHub Actions, Jenkins, Circle CI. Uh, you could run it on just like a VM in a cloud. You can run it on your Roomba, like it really anywhere that can run your code. Have um, you had people do that? It's, it's on my list to try. Um, I think <laughs> okay. based on my research so far, it seems like the Roomba might be a bit ambitious based on just the hardware that what? it has. But yeah, we'll see. Well, maybe that'll be... Uh, a future content challenge that, uh, that we can put out like yeah. a hacker fun <laughs> who runs stagger on the craziest environment <laughs> exactly yeah but literally anywhere that you can run containers mm -hmm. you can run dagger um awesome. so that's kind of the, the key um and the 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 important part about running anywhere is that it runs the same anywhere right so that means if i run it on my machine it's going to run exactly the same as when it runs in CI or on my Roomba, right? It's it's not. Yeah. Uh, so that means you're you're not restricted by what tools you have installed on the machine or other uh, environmental differences between machines. Your pipeline needs to be the exact same. Uh, so mm -hmm. when we look at some code, we'll see like how we accomplish that. Um, so that is the overview of what is Dagger. Awesome. I have some questions. <laughs> before we jump, before we go further. So basically, when I was first looking at Dagger, I watched Victor Farzik's um, YouTube video, right? On, on this is Dagger, right? Yeah. And yeah. there it kind of, at some point in the middle of this video, I think, he mentioned that if you have your Go code, right? And you, you compile it, you run it, you would you would run it, like you said, you would run it anywhere, whether, that you, whether you're running it on GitHub Actions or CircleCI or CodeFresh, because you're basically just executing your Go, Golang code, right? That That's all there is in that in that example, right? That case. Exactly. And that's kind of where it made click of like, oh, I don't need to rewrite my different actions for different pipelines if I want to, for example, use GitHub Actions in addition to GitLab CI, right? It just, it's the same thing. Exactly. That's one of the, you know, the limitations of your typical CI, like GitHub Actions, mm -hmm. is that that configuration, all that YAML that you write, that yeah. can only be interpreted and executed inside of GitHub Actions. And so if you're trying to write that pipeline itself, the only way to run that thing and see what it does is to push it to GitHub and let it run. Um, yeah. Whereas with a portable thing, you can iterate locally and see what's happening without pushing. There's so many screenshots, and it, I mean, it happened to me every time I wanted to set up a completely new pipeline that I push, it's running, it fails. I make the changes locally. I push, <laughs> it's running, it fails. Exactly, yeah. I have a long list of records of my GitLab, uh, GitHub action pipeline just failing until I finally get it to work, and then you don't touch it anymore. <laughs> That's right, you, you don't touch it. and Exactly. Not only like trying to figure out the logic of putting those things together, but also <laughs> just writing YAML in general, I feel like, I mean, YAML is not for humans to write. Like, it's it's uh, a machine configuration. Yeah. And so it's something you can't just look at and visually see. Like, there's something wrong with this this YAML space here, right? It's um, yeah. It's it's not a proper language. So that's what Dagger brings. Other question. Yes. That just came to me when you mentioned, oh, we write code, because when I write code. I mean, I'm not the best developer. I make a lot of mistakes, right? So I wouldn't trust, for example, my code without it being reviewed by somebody to just run anywhere, right? Is there, for people, a concern that if they let their engineers or other people, DevOps people, write their pipelines in code, that people will make more mistakes versus fewer mistakes if they are constrained by unreadable YAML? <laughs> Is that a concern or is it just in my mind that I just, I don't know, thought about it and it's not actually something that people are worried no, about? totally. So let's, I mean, we won't dig into any real code yet, but this is um, just for like a visual example. Yeah. Um, one of the, the classic things that I always had in my roles as release engineer is that I would make a PR that updates to YAML and then yeah. people on the developer team that would... Um, own the app that I was making these pipeline changes to. I mean, they they can't read that. Like a diff in YAML is something that's meaningless to anybody, right? So they would always just see it, see it's for me and approve it. And then it would go in whether it works or not. 
Yeah. Um, and again, without actually running that YAML somehow, I, I don't know if it's good or not, right? So yeah, it, it's one of those things where a uh, YAML diff is, is, is a really hard thing to review versus a code yeah. diff where, you know, the, the application team, if they work with Go every day, they might not know the specifics of the part of the pipeline that I might be updating, but they yeah. can see the, the code difference and understand that better than a YAML diff. Yeah. So you're basically aiming to get more people, more stakeholders involved into DevOps processes who would nest, who would otherwise be locked out ultimately by the tools that they are unfamiliar with. Can I summarize? Exactly. That? There's yeah, perfect. Yeah, there's uh, <laughs> actually a, a Twitter thread that I think Charity Majors retweeted the other day that that I thought was yeah. really relevant to this because it was, it was about getting participation. Yeah. Um, and I might be interpreting this in my own way, but like what I got out of this thread was is getting more participation in these parts of the processes because whenever you get to this point where you have this yeah. um, centralized build team that owns the build part of your app yeah. and the development team doesn't have doesn't participate in that yeah. but now you've put up this wall and it's no longer devops it's just ops yeah. and ops. dev right <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah exactly so when you get this um the goal here is really to get the participation on both ends in that build and yeah. ci process awesome Cool. So before we dive into the live demo and getting started with Dagger hands on, if anybody has some questions, post them in the chat and I will I will ask them and we will talk about it and address all the questions. So <laughs> feel free to participate and let's dive into the, the live demo. How do I get started with Dagger? Awesome. So uh, we're going to use a sample application for this that um, is a great example because I think it mimics a lot of real world mm -hmm. uh, scenarios for, for what different teams might see. So this yep. is like the classic um, Docker example voting app that you might've seen before in other um, yeah. demos from other people. But the idea is it's got this really cool architecture where we have a few different applications that have some shared data sources. Um, and the idea is we've got like, uh, a it's a voting app. So we, we vote on, uh, in this case, cats versus dogs. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe it's too controversial, but uh, <laughs> we're going to vote for dogs today on my end because I'm driving. <laughs> uh, and so we've got a front end where you actually vote, and that's uh, a Python Flask application. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got another front end uh, with Node, and that shows the voting results. And there's some databases with Redis and Postgres behind the scenes and a dotnet worker that um, takes the votes and tabulates them and puts them in the postgres database yeah so anyway our goal here is to write some ci for this stack um and one of the cool things like the the basic version of this that uh before my changes is that it's got a, a docker compose that you can run this whole stack okay um, and so one of the reasons that i think this is cool is because Docker Compose is really great, great for that development cycle, but often mm -hmm. like the configuration of, of how this, how these services depend on each other and how the um, services are run and how they're configured, the Docker Compose often drifts from your actual application uh, code for production, right? Because your production probably isn't running yeah. that Compose itself; it's running yeah. some other thing. Yeah. Um, and so what what we'll see with Dagger is that you have one thing that defines how it's run and that can be used locally and wherever we're running things. So, so that's what we're going to look at. So over here, um, and hopefully that's a nice size. Uh, we have this so, example. Wait, just to iterate. Yes. Sorry, just to iterate. So we are basically aiming to replace the Docker Compose or we are using the Docker Compose. Exactly. The, we're replacing so we, it. So we would like to replace the Docker Compose using that. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the first thing is, you know, we I, I mentioned we have these different, um, uh oh, okay, there we go. Hopefully you can still see this. Um, yeah, I see, I see the browser, okay. the diagram. Excellent. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so, okay, sorry, my my windows moved around. Um, so we've got this application, and we want to write um, some code that mimics, uh, or not mimics, but it, it builds our different services. Mm -hmm. um, so if we go back to our code here uh, and just look at it, so we've got that 
the vote application. This is all in like a little mono repo. Uh, the yep. result application, the worker. Uh, we've got another thing that can see the data. So if we spin up a, a stack locally, we can put a bunch of fake data in it so we have some data to work with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's about it. So then in this case, we want to make our CI do all the things that Compose was doing. Um, so if we start maybe with the vote service um, and look at our CI directory, we've written a dagger module for the vote service. So we'll kind of start there and then work back to like the part that pulls all those together and then see how um, see how that actually can replace the Docker Compose. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I go to that, uh, see I vote. Um, and again, that vote application, if you look at that, was Python. So we're actually going to write the CI for vote in Python. And that way, if you can imagine this as like a real world organization, then again, that team maintaining that vote application can participate in the CI for that because it's in the language they use. You had, go back to the directory. Yes. So you need to explain that. <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you had in this. Okay, here, here, wait. In the CI directory. Oh, sure. You had a main.go file. Yes. So it's basically, but then you're using within the root directory, you're using a Python CI in Dagger. How does yeah, that? Yeah, great question. So, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, so let's look at, uh, maybe that's too much. OK, so yeah. within our CI directory, we've got um, sub modules for each of those components or, of our stack. Yeah. So we've got like one for vote and worker and result and seed and so on. Mm -hmm. And so at the top level, we've got this kind of the highest level pipeline that pulls all the different parts of our application together. Yeah. Um, and let's say, for example, in this application, that pipeline is mostly maintained by like a central team. Right. Yeah. And so that team happens to work and go uh, most of the time. Um, the the application team for the vote application mainly works in Python. Yeah. So this module is going to be in Python. Uh, awesome. The result team mostly works in TypeScript, so this module is going to be in TypeScript. Mm. Uh, and then the worker team mostly works in .NET. And well, we do have uh, an experimental .NET. Yeah, SDK in the works. Uh, I wrote this one to go because, <laughs> as the the author of the demo, I don't know anything about .NET yet, but I will learn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but soon enough. Yeah, awesome. Uh, and same with that that seed one is in Go. Uh, so we've got a lot of different languages mixed mm -hmm. into the CI, but we'll see when we go to kind of the top level um, how that doesn't add to the complexity of this pipeline. It it, it just whatever part of the pipeline you're focusing on, it's going to feel native to that language. Um, yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll see that in action here. Um, so yeah, let's let's check out that, um, the vote one, for example. So one of the um, things we see a lot in, in kind of platforms in general, especially outside of CI, uh, is that the easiest way to have all of these different teams uh, work together and have a central team that orchestrates all of that is to kind of define interfaces, right? So if you look at mm -hmm. like um, just running your application in general, when you work with um, Kubernetes, you you often have um, each application maybe the the relationship between the app team and the platform team is like your app has to or has to provide um, like a Docker file or some yeah. template that runs it in Kubernetes or a Helm chart, somewhere in that range of like, we need you yeah. to tell us how to get your app and how to run it. Um, yeah. And I think that those same principles apply to uh, running a CI CD as code for like an organization like this. So in this case, uh, we say your application should provide uh, like a build function that says how to build it. And that gives me a container with your app in it. Um, so this is almost like, providing a Docker file, but this is code instead. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have one that returns a service. And this is the same kind of thing of like, we've built a container and now we're saying how the container is going to run. 
Um, yep. And so you might have, you probably would have a lot more like running unit tests or integration tests or linting or all these other functions that would be kind of part of that standard interface. But when we look at all the different applications in the stack, they're going to kind of share that interface of like, in this case, we have build and serve. And those are the two functions that we expect an app to show. And that way, as someone on like that, that centralized like build team or platform team, I don't have to worry too much about, um, you know, what the different functions are within an application. I just mm -hmm. know it should have these things and I know uh, how to deal with those, right? Yeah. Um, so now looking at some code itself, um, this is basically just pure like native dagger code. Um, so we're going to say uh, to get a container for our vote application, uh, it should be on the, the Python 3.11 slim image. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're going to install curl on it. Uh, and we're going to kind of clean up the, the cruft that you get with, with that image. And then we're going to put our um, requirements.txt. And this is like, uh, if you're not familiar with Python, it's just the thing that says, these are my dependencies for my app. Yeah. Um, and so we install our dependencies, and then we put our whole application into this directory where it's expected to be. Um, so that's it. This this function gives us a container with our vote app in it. And then like looking at the function that actually runs it, it does the same things. And I could have um, just called this build function and then added things to it, but uh, we're doing some copy paste here and that's okay. Um, but that was like, again, one of the benefits of writing code is that you don't have to repeat yourself like you do in YAML. You can just write functions that abstract mm. away all the repeated bits, right? Yeah. Um, but we didn't do that here and that's fine. Um, and so we do the, the same things, but then we say, and this container also uh, has this port and it has a backend service. Cause again, if we look at our diagram, the yeah. code application in Python, needs to connect to this Redis service. So when we ask for a service, we pass in a Redis service and we say, bind it here and then actually execute our application and return that. Um, so this is like specifically just for that, that vote app. This is our, our CI. Yeah. So any questions so far on this or we'll look at, we'll kind of zoom out a bit and see all the things pulled together. It's good. Awesome. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, yeah, no, it makes sense. Totally. Um, how complex does it get from here? Like, is this as complex as you would go or with Dagger say, you could go indefinitely, how, however complex you want to have your, your setup or based on your needs? Yeah, you, you can, some, yeah, yeah you can get as complex as you want. I, yeah. I would say in terms of like how verbose my actual code is, this is probably as complex as it gets because I'm not use, reusing any modules here. I'm just writing yeah. everything from scratch using na yeah. uh, native dagger things. So, you know, ideally I could replace this whole bit where I get a Python image and, and set up everything. I could replace this with a module that says, give me a Python image from my org. And then as a platform team, I can define a function that says, this is how you get a Python image. Um, and then we don't have to repeat this in all the different applications that might use Python, right? Yeah. Um, and same with like, you know, we can mount cache volumes for our dependencies and that would probably be part of that abstracted function. And now we're getting a bit deeper into some of the more complex things you can do with Dagger. But that's like, here we're kind of building it all from scratch. But the idea is, again, looking at um, our image here is that we have these modules that have these um, composable building blocks. And so yeah. when you're writing a pipeline, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You have these components to, to build these things with. I guess the main difference here is that you have access to how the containers actually build, which you wouldn't have in other CICD pipelines. You wouldn't, right? You, you would have a static file that you take and then you would have to make changes to that file and copy it into different environments and uh, versus exactly yeah this is usable components yeah this is what gives us that uh, that portability of run the pipeline anywhere it's like we don't care anymore what version of python i have on my machine 
or what yep. version we have in GitHub Actions or Jenkins, because uh, we're saying this is the runtime for our service. Um, and the same goes for tests and doing other tasks like linting. Like I, I love the linting example because that's one where the version of whatever linter we happen to use is going to be different on literally everyone's machine yeah. uh, down to like whatever patch, patch version. And it might behave differently. And that's like, how often do you make some changes on your machine, run all the checks on your machine and it looks good. And then you push to CI and it fails yeah. because it's not the exact same thing that's being run. Uh, but with Dagger, it's literally the exact same thing all the time. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so yeah, so now we'll pull it together along with those other um, services in our stack. And so if we look at the build first, um, this is where kind of that, that common interface really helps us out because now we've got at the top level a build function. And all this does is looks at all of our other submodules. So like uh, the votes, the results, and the worker, and then call their build function with their directory of our app, right? So now as the team implementing this, we don't actually care like how the vote builds. We just say call builds with the, that part of the app. And it looks consistent across our application. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, it, it makes it much, much easier um, to work with a bunch of teams that are doing different things in maybe different languages. Because again, this is this one's written in Go. And we didn't really care or even notice that the vote build function is written in Python. Yeah. And the result build functions in TypeScript. And this one's in Go because we call them all the exact same way, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not like breaking my immersion as a Go developer. It's all just Go. Um, and then similarly, like looking at the the serve one, now we have to have some um, awareness of like what this uh, what this dependency is of like what needs what service. But since uh, for vote, for example we require that you pass in a Redis service. Now we know, okay, this isn't going to run unless I give it a Redis service and result needs a Postgres database and the worker actually needs both, right? So we pass those in and then this thing, don't worry about the implementation of it, but it's kind of a cool thing so that we can say, run a whole bunch of services and give me just all of them on my local host uh, mm -hmm. as different ports. Um, so this is kind of what's emulating that um, the Docker compose. Um, yeah. And so. So just yeah, wait, this, this yeah. function is basically the value that you would otherwise get through Docker compose. Sorry, one more time. <laughs> so I'm just, so the thing is I never really use Docker compose. So okay. basically if you set up Docker compose, the main thing is that everything runs in a way that it's supposed to be connected locally, right? So yes. So in this case, the main thing that you would just need because you're running this on your local machine, just to make sure that things are working as you run it on your local machine, the only thing that you, that, uh, how do you express it? That you would run um, as part of your pipeline to make sure locally that it's working is the proxy part here. Everything else will then also run in the remote pipeline, but you wouldn't run Docker Compose. Would you run your Docker Compose in your remote pipeline? Um, you might run it in a test pipeline, but not in like a production set. Mm. So I was trying to pull it up here, but for some reason, not all the keys are working. Okay, there we go. Uh, Docker compose. Okay, so this is um, just looking at these things side by side. Really yeah, quick. awesome. Um, so we have uh, a bunch of services defined in the Docker compose. Uh, and so we have for the vote service, it says build it with that vote directory, and it depends on Redis, which has some health checks, um, and yeah. it's got these ports. So this is, if we look over here, this is exactly what we've done on the Dagger side is we've got vote, uh, we've already given it Redis, and it's got these ports. Um, and then we can kind of see the same thing for each of these. So this is the Docker Compose defined in YAML that yeah. we can run locally. Uh, and like you said, maybe like for, for tests or something else versus over here, we're pulling it together in this function to accomplish that, that local um, development experience. But 
the the function we define to actually create those services, those can be reused if we're deploying them to production. Um, yeah. to actually get that container configured in that way. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. So let me push this back to the side here. And then, um, so let's say we, we've got this application and we want to start doing dagger things with it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we talked a bit about like reusable modules. And one of the cool things like with uh, uh, Dagger CLI, without even writing any of that code yet, we can use those modules to start doing things with our app, right? So one thing I want to show, if we go to the Daggerverse and uh, there's this tool called Rough. Um, and essentially for our purposes here, it's a Python linter. Um, mm -hmm. I think if people are like really into Rough, they might be like, oh, it's so much more than that. And it <laughs> totally is. But for our case right now, it's a Python linter. And so what we can do is we can look at Daggerverse and say there's this module for Rough. Um, as someone who's not like that experienced with Python or I don't work with this Python app every day. I don't yeah. have this tool set up locally. Um, and yeah. with Dagger, I don't need to worry about that setup at all. I don't, I can just run rough check, which is like the, the linting function for apps. So if I say uh, Dagger rough, and first we should uh, install it. So if I say Dagger install, uh, so I'm going to, with the Dagger CLI, install that module. And all this does is we'll see the Dagger CLI go out and look at my configuration and figure out where that module is. Um, but I'm not actually installing anything on my machine itself. I'm just saying in my yeah. configuration, uh, in my Dagger configuration here, which is my Dagger JSON in my project, I've just added that as like a dependency. So this is almost similar, like if you've worked a lot with um, JavaScript or any like NPM repos, like dev dependencies where you've got tools specified that you might yeah. use as like dev tools, right? So now I have this thing called rough, which is like what I installed and it's got this specific version. So now anyone with my repo clone, they can just clone and say uh, dagger dash M rough. Uh, and we can say functions to see what we can do with rough. But now that it's in that dagger JSON, anyone with this project, when they run this, they're going to be using the same version of that dependency too. So we're tracking those versions and then we're going to have a consistent experience on different machines. Uh, so again, it's got that function check, which we knew about because we were out here looking at it in mm -hmm. daggerverse. So if I say dagger dash M rough, uh, check and we want to know how to run this. So let's say help. Uh, did I do that wrong? Oh, we want to call the function check. Uh, so with a module rough, we call check, and then we're going to ask for help on how to, to call it. So uh, the flags for this function, directory, a directory. And um, if I <laughs> if I were more helpful, we could see that I am the author of this, this rough module. <laughs> I would provide a bit more flavor text to say this is the directory for the thing uh, for a Python project or a lint. But anyway, <laughs> that's you will end it after this. Nice yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so let's say call check. And so now we're going to, again, with the rough module, we're going to call that check function. And we're going to pass in a directory, which is that vote subdirectory. So that's our, our Python project. Yeah. Uh, so now we're going to call this thing. Again, I haven't actually installed Rough anywhere. It's just running within Dagger, and it knows where to find that module because it's in our Dagger JSON, uh, and it passed. So if I say I go status, we're good. Um, again, we if my module outputs some more things, like you're all good, we would know that now. But the main thing is, like, without actually writing any Dagger code, I was able to run uh this module out here and there's like tons of other modules for like dev things you might want to do without actually writing any pipelines yet yeah um, so we can just say so in this case we were able to lint the python project uh, so basically now, yeah 
In that case, Dagger would provide your dev team with a wrapper around different tools that your organization wants you to use without having to care how you install it locally. Yeah, exactly. So instead of having like a, uh, maybe a, a list of all these tools you have to install to work with a repo or yeah. uh, like a, a brew file or any of these things that help you in install things to work with the project, uh, yeah. those can just be Dagger modules and all you need is Dagger and then you can use the tools. Awesome. And then, so now we say for like our, the module that we were just looking at in code, uh, what functions we have. And again, we expected those two functions that we looked at to be there. Makes sense. Um, and so we can do the build. So if we uh, run the build, what we're doing, and we can just look at it one more time just to remember what that looks like. So the build is just going to uh, build a container for each of those parts of our project. Uh, and so the useful part of this, I guess, is that we'll know if any of them had any errors. So if we had an error building any of our apps, um, this would fail and we would see some stack trace or something. Uh, call build and it wants a directory. And once this finishes, we can look at how that happens too. Um, but again, it'll go through all those modules. It'll go out and um, figure out uh, how to run those things. It's going to you know, we, we had some in different languages, but it'll run those different runtimes for those modules, um, each in their own sandbox. So like the the vote build is happening in its own sandbox, isolated from the result build yeah. and those things. Um, so we got nil, which uh, happily means everything was, good. we can look at the status again to see our Xcode. But awesome. uh, if I look at our commands, so again, we did a dagger call build. So we're calling that function called build and we're passing in directory, which is like the project we want to build. Um, and I just want to highlight the, that flag directory. Um, if we go back to our build function, that's happening just because the argument for our function is called directory. So if we rename that to foo, then our flag would be called foo um, and yeah. so on. And it's directory here is a um, one of the core dagger types. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're calling this from another function, you can pass it in just like we did up here as the type itself, or you mm -hmm. can pass in like a local path and Dagger will figure out how to turn that into a, a Dagger directory. You could pass in like a Git URL. And again, Dagger will say, okay, that looks like a Git URL. I know how to turn that into a directory of files. Um, so there's all kinds of like magical things happening with this CLI to turn this into um, however we want to Mm -hmm. pass things into our function. So the fun part now, we wanted to replace the Docker Compose, right? So actually, let's look at this one more time. So all we have to do is pass in a directory and we get back a service. So let's do that. Uh, and we got a bit of a spoiler there, but we, so again, Dagger calls, the function was called serve and we pass in the directory and then this will run and it's like, cool, you gave me a service, but what do you want to do with that service? Um, and so now we can, just like we did in, and maybe we're getting a bit advanced here, but uh, just like we did in um, those modules, we're chaining these different commands off of these different types. And yeah. so we, with a service type, we could do a few things with it, but in this case, we want to just run the service uh, on our machine and give it some ports. And so that's what we're going to pass in is these arguments now is we're going to say, okay, we're calling the function serve with the argument directory. And so now we've got a service. And so the service we're going to call up, which is just, you know, up the service, which is kind of like a uh, Docker compose up uh, is a, a similar concept. Yeah. And with up, we're passing in these arguments. Okay for these ports on my host to the ports in that service. Um, so we'll have mm -hmm. like port 5,000 going to 5,000 and 5,001 to 5,001. So when you run this now, Dagger knows, okay, I've got a service and I want to start it. And here's my port configuration. Um, and so now, again, we have all these different languages doing all these different things in the background. We have, when we run this, we've got a Postgres database running, a Redis database running, and they're all wired together. Uh, but now it looks like we've got things running. 
So if I go to my web browser and that local host 5,000, here's our vote page. So you can vote cats versus dogs. And we can see this is like the host name that it prints on the page down here. So this is mm -hmm. inside of Dagger. Um, inside of the Dagger engine. Up. Inside of the Dagger engine. Yeah, exactly. So if we, so here's our result page. So we'll look at some cool things real quick. Um, but let's see. Uh, so while that runs, so I, if I do Docker PS um, to see what containers I'm running, uh, we just have, well, in my case, two versions of the engine because I have uh, a development version as well. But <laughs> yeah. you'll notice specifically, like we don't see like the vote service and the result service and Postgres and all these things. Those are all just within my engine, um, and so. so do they yeah. run as containers in the container and like in the engine that's a container or how does that how does it work exactly so they're, they're running um directly within that engine so it, it doesn't necessarily have have to be docker but any container runtime um but yeah within that engine we have a bunch of containers running uh, and it has its own way of orchestrating those uh and yeah it's just kind of transparent to or um it's just a box for the user to say like inside of the engine, we have lots of things going on. Cause there could also be, yeah. um, if this were in CI, for example, we could have someone else's st stack running and some other builds going yeah. on uh, in parallel. Right. And all these different operations happening. Yeah. Can you apply additional security controls and enforce them in your yeah. Dega engine or how does it add to some advantages like that? Yeah, so by by default, um, there's there's a lot of controls that you can put in place. We have actually some really cool guides on um, our docs about actually running, um, for example, Dagger within Kubernetes. Um, mm -hmm. So you can run, let's see, guides. The Dagger uh, engine within a Kubernetes cluster. Exactly. So this way, uh, yeah, so the, here's a, a great guide right here. Um, so for example, for, for Dagger ourselves, we run Dagger and Kubernetes to use with GitHub Actions. And so mm -hmm. GitHub Actions has ways of talking to GitHub Actions runners within Kubernetes. And those GitHub Actions runners will have um, Dagger engine running as, um, I think today running as sidecars to say this engine has, or this, the GitHub Action runner has a Dagger engine. And then those things are bound together. Um, but there's lots of like different architectures you can go with as well. But um, yeah, so here's, we have a few different guys. This is one of them to talk about um, actually using our Helm chart uh, to deploy within Kubernetes. Could you then hypothetically set up different, so I set up different environments as different Kubernetes clusters and then for people to test things in a dev environment, they use the Dagger engine that's running in a dev environment versus staging versus prod or how would that work? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And that's where like you're asking about like security. That's where um, the security is really more around like how the user is getting into that pod yeah. versus like Dagger itself implementing any kind of security. Yeah. Like there's no like built in Thank tunneling you. or anything like that. But if you, as a developer have a way to get into that cluster and run something against a pod, then yeah, that's exactly what you could do. The same way that GitHub Actions would do that from within the cluster. Hmm. Um, the cool thing is too, like, so all of these things that are running in the engine have, like there's lots and lots of caching around behind the scenes. So anything that, um, any of those uh, executions that are happening, like building that Python image, for example, yeah. those are all getting cached and then if we leverage uh, Dagger Cloud, we can actually share that cache across everyone using Dagger. And so you wouldn't necessarily even need to have that remote engine running somewhere. You are okay. you could be sharing a cache with another developer, uh, both running engines locally. Um, and that way oh. you're all benefiting from the same thing. But also that means like if you run all your tests locally and then push your commit up to GitHub and then that runs in CI, then CI can share that cache too. And your CI will basically be like a no-op. It'll be like an instant, like, 
all these tests for cash and it passes, um, which saves a lot of time on that that feedback loop uh, within yeah. CI. Um, one more thing with this demo too. So I mentioned earlier, like we've got a bunch of, uh, we, we have a way to seed a bunch of data into the database. Um, and so we have, um, if you look at CI seed, I had another module in here that is just that seed function. So if I say dagger uh, dash M seed functions, uh, it's got a function to actually run that seed. So we've still got the service running in this left terminal, but we mm -hmm. can say uh, dagger M seed uh, call. And so now, uh, let me make this bigger for everybody. So, so now we're gonna call that module seed. Uh, we're gonna call the run function that just runs the seed function basically. Um, and so we're gonna pass in again the, the directory seed data, which is where that those scripts are that run all the database seeding. Uh, and then it requires a service. Actually, maybe we should just look at that real quick. So um, CI seed. Okay, so here's our our function to seed all the data into the database. And so basically it just runs a bunch of scripts against our vote API. Yeah. Uh, and so to do that, we have to pass in that vote API as a service so that it can bind that to our, uh, to our seed scripts and then run the generate votes bash script basically. Um, and so what we're gonna do is uh, to pass in that vote as a service, Again, I mentioned like with directories, the CLI can like, you can pass it things in a few different ways and they'll figure out how to turn that into like a dagger type, right? And yeah. so within our code, we could pass that service in as a dagger service that we already have. In this case, I'm just gonna give it this URL of like localhost 5000 where we've already got vote running in this other dagger terminal, right? Yeah. Um, and by doing that, it's gonna say, okay, I see a, a protocol and a port, and I know how to turn that into a service, and it'll just do that behind the scenes. We can run this, um, and so it's going to. We can see actually a bunch of stuff moving on the left, and so we're getting a bunch of API calls happening uh, between two different Dagger sessions now. Um, that are actually the left one is forwarding a, a a service to our host, and then the right one is looking at that service on the host and <laughs> making calls into it. And so Dagger is talking to itself, but via my host, because we've got this, uh, these two different sessions. And so yeah. once this script executes uh, and we see a bunch more calls happening, we can actually oh. see this <laughs> moving around in real time, right? Uh, so we've got a hundred votes now and somehow that ended up exactly 50-50. Uh, and I think it's random, so that's pretty crazy. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, so uh, I thought that was kind of neat to show like that we just passed in, yeah. in this other call that we just passed in like this uh, this URL and then it's it was able to run against another dagger session that um, yeah no, that, that is happens pretty to be cool. also running and then awesome. we can submit our vote just to be sure that <laughs> our, our voice is heard for dogs but it seems like the random scripts <laughs> are losing today for oh, dogs. No. <laughs> Uh, that's okay. That it's all simulated. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So that was the main thing I wanted to show with, with yeah. um, all of these modules. Is there anything you wanted to dig in more? Um, or we can talk more like high level. Yes. If anybody in the audience, if anybody listening right now has questions, either live right now, then please post them in the chat and we will address them. Kyle will be asked answering them um and if you're watching the recording then co just comment below and i'm sure the dagger folks and kyle will monitor also the comments otherwise i'm going to ping them with the comments um so post them in the comments if you're watching the recording otherwise if you have any questions any comments thoughts anything you would like to share then post it right now in the in the live stream chat um mohana is asking is this new coding skill um, what do you mean? Is this like a new, do you need more coding skills? Is that what you're asking to, to use Dagger? You basically, so we, we covered this at the beginning of the live stream. You can use with Dagger your existing knowledge. So if you're using TypeScript, you can use the TypeScript 
SDK. If you're using Go, you can use the Go SDK. We can also maybe go back to the overview of the different modules, the Dagger modules. Yeah. And they are different. They're written in different um, programming languages. So uh, and the beauty of that is really that if you have different, and you probably have different teams, front end team, back end team, who use different stacks, that they can then use whatever uh, language they are most comfortable with. Jeremy Adams is saying, great demo. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kyle. That Thank was you. a great demo. Yes. So where let's maybe dive into if I want to get started with Dagger. There are probably lots of people watching either right now or the recording, and they're like, okay, this is really awesome, but it has a it has an onboarding curve. Let's be honest, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not like because they, I mean, for GitHub Actions, for example. It has been around for so long. It's any tool that has been around for so long. It, you just I, a lot of times it just copy paste, right? So, yeah. how do I get started with Dagger now? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, even though it's using, you know, even though you're from the comfort of your favorite language, uh, there's still you know new SDK things to learn. Um, and so, the best place to start is if you go over to Dagger.io. There's docs, and we have some really cool. Um, quick start guides that kind of go through the, the basics that we talked about and kind of uh, hold your hand to walk through uh, actually writing some code. Uh, and from there, you can actually get to our Discord where you can find myself and the whole Dagger team. And we're in there like answering questions all day, every day. So if you have even the most basic question, those are like the easiest for us to answer. So feel free to ask the yeah. most basic questions or the most advanced questions, does not matter. Um, it's it's a, a friendly place. Also, the questions definitely help the Dagger team to improve the tooling. So ask all the questions you have because it will just make the tool better um, and yes. you're contributing to the tool, right? Um, amazing. Cool. Um, anything else you would like to highlight to people? If there are no questions in the chat. If there are any questions in the chat, please ask now. <laughs> yeah, no. I. Uh, uh, we're going to be uh, at Sivo Navigate next week in Austin, and we'll be at KubeCon EU in a couple of weeks. Uh, so come find us there in person if you're going to be there. Otherwise, find us in Discord, uh, and we'd love to chat. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on, Kat. This was a really great demo. Um, I'm sure we're going to see lots more from Dega also on my channel and uh, on my blog. So excited for that and also to see you at the conferences and yeah awesome thank you awesome thank great. you so much for having me definitely always have an amazing day thank you for everybody who's been watching thank you so much this was an amazing live stream bye bye everybody awesome. thank you <laughs> Bye. bye